Hey everybody, thanks for watching. This is the Be A Better Golf channel. Click the subscribe button, it really helps the channel out a lot. Today I'm doing a FaceTime call with Tony Lutzak. We were gonna do a live broadcast, but uh, we're having some crashes uh, through <laughs> Google. So uh, I'm FaceTiming with Tony in Mississippi. Tony, just to recap you guys, is a PGA golf pro who put his golf teaching career on hold to go back to school and he's gotten his master's and now he's in the process of getting his PhD in, is it human factors engineering, Tony? Correct. Yep, cool. that's it. Very cool. So Tony, uh, I know that this semester is something that you were looking forward to because it's kind of beyond uh, books and classroom stuff and more into actual scientific study. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing this semester and some of the equipment that you have. It's really cool. We have the MSU football team, the players coming in. We're assessing jump four different jumps in our motion monitor software. So we have Vicon cameras. We're going to put the markers all over the body, jump, have them jump on forest flights, mm -hmm. and get a before and after their training session this spring, this summer. That's cool. So, so I'm imagining what you're talking about is like a vertical jump, a straight sideways jump each ways, and then maybe a backward jump, or what is it? it we're doing a drop jump. So you kind of step off a platform. So you rebound um, and jump. Kind of rebound, exactly. Yeah. Multiple jumps, like a four jumps, hands are on the hips, just bounce, and then they want to see uh, as high as you can vertical. Yeah, you can and do whatever you want with your hands at that point. Yeah. They actually don't want them to use their arms. They're trying to assess all the power in the lower body. Strange. So, okay. yeah, it's just a technique. Um, coach Pirelli, the strength conditioning coach, is very aware of the biomechanics and understands that all the players are not the same. So you can't have everyone do deep squats, high bar. It hurts the knees. So he, he really adjusts it. To each player. So, what are they looking to to get out of this data? Like, are they gonna something that they're gonna save and and like correlate backwards with injuries later on, or what? Exactly. Okay. Injuries, uh, workouts, and then um, hopefully be able to see big improvements will, will then show up on the field. So we see a lot of stuff in the in the golf science industry, if you would call it that, about people using. Uh, motion capture units and stuff. And I remember an interview that I did with you uh, maybe a year and a half ago or uh, maybe a year ago where you said something that got a lot of uh, kind of almost controversy going on uh, Be Better Golf where you said that, okay, we have basically figured out the golf swing. We know what it is. We know what it does. The golf swing is really not such a mystery anymore between uh, the Nesbitt stuff and the Dr. Kwan stuff. It, it was basically, we know what happens with the golf swing. So that's basically unraveled and figured out. What we don't know is how do we make it happen and what are the motor control things that actually make, you know, turn somebody from an okay player to a very good player, from a horrible player to a great player, whatever. So what I was wondering is, when I saw, when I heard that you were getting access to this uh, very expensive, very high-tech motion capture system, well, I was wondering, well, what's the point of that? Is there anything useful really left to know about that? Or how are you going to use it to get more information on actually how to make the good things happen rather than just review what already good golfers are doing or already bad golfers are doing? We're actually going to work on developing products to kind of a biofeedback system. So this way... We know the swing parameters. We can then build systems to train people to create better swings. So we're using it as kind of a, I guess a, what would you call it, a, a baseline. Mm -hmm. So this way we know what is actually happening. We don't perceive it. We know that, hey, the hand path is here, club's here. This is the best way to move it. So you're so, using the motion capture to to see what the effects of different either training modalities or like uh, aids that you're using, things like that. Exactly, and we're also building our own. Oh, okay, okay, got you. Like demonstrably better than others in the golf yes. swing. What yes. would some of those things be? Could right wrist extension. 
is key. Uh-huh. So when we look at club head speed, if we don't have good extension deflection, we're not going to have good contact. So much of the stuff we hear about with golf instruction, like if, if I do a Google search now for golf power stuff, I'm going to see so much stuff about the lower body and the hips and everything. Now, is it the further you get away from the club, the, the, the less you've seen it mattering as far as like what actually, like when I said like, okay, what are the body motions that are, that are demonstrably matter to, you know, somebody making a good motion? Is it, like footwork we hear a lot about or like how your head moves. What are some of the things that actually matter? Like in how the so body take, moves. Yeah. So if we take a look at the pelvis Yeah. and a lot of people want it to spin and rotate. Well, with the motion capture system, we can actually evaluate, is it a pivot? Mm -hmm. Is it a rotation? I mean, I know what I want our players to do, but you know, we've seen a lot of players kind of spin out. And still get a lot of hand speed. Mm -hmm. So, is that an advantage? Is that a a disadvantage? I guess. Right. So we're going to be taking a look at what the pelvis is doing, and with the motion capture system, we can actually dot it up and actually be able to measure it in three D motion. One thing that happened uh, during the Masters, if you guys have seen the uh, that show that comes on on the internet before the Masters, it's called like Live on the Range or something. You know, it's, it's just on masters.com. And uh, Stuart Sink was watching, I think it was Charlie Hoffman and Bryson DeChambeau. As an interesting aside, both guys were using a whole bunch of training aids and other stuff that I don't think you would have seen on the range 20 years ago at all. But um, the, the swing styles of each of these guys were, were totally different. And he said, now there's two totally different swing styles. And he said, but I got to tell the people out there, Whatever your your philosophy on the golf swing, however you're trying to swing the golf club, I got to tell you, it doesn't matter at all. It matters not at all, as long as you totally believe in what you're doing. Now, I've seen golfers with all kinds of different philosophies have success, and I've also seen it completely derail their careers. I'll do a longer video about exactly what it is, but just to let you guys know, it is about three hours of content, exclusive content that you just get through this, uh, the Reactionary Golf Master Class. We did a three, a two hour long lesson in Las Vegas, and then uh, go on further, we did uh, five different videos in Orlando after our uh, Be Better Golf School, and some faults and fixes, and also some supplemental content. So Tony, you're saying, before, tell, tell me again that analogy between like the computer and the program and why you think the reactionary golf swing program is uh, something that people should be interested in if they want to get better. Golf swing is a ballistic motion. So when we have to pre-program our mind in order to make it work. That's part, the biggest element of reactionary, reactionary golf. So if you sit there and try to hit position, am I doing it right, doing it wrong? Another position, that's called uh, feedback. We want to speed forward, plan it. This is what you're going to do, execute it, and then be able to wrap to the, the shot that you want to hit. So that's where... We coordinate the outside with the inside, and that's where the arms create a lot of the perceived control, but the whole has to be coordinated with the arms and body and club. Yeah, and this, in the Reactionary Golf Masterclass, you guys, if you can check it out at bebettergolf.net slash premium. One of the, the, the feedback that we got from building your Reactionary Golf Swing was people wanted a lot more information on what the lower right. body does. And I think one of the things that was maybe misunderstood when you were first on the channel was that uh, that people were thinking that, okay, well, if 85 or 90 percent of the power is coming from the upper body, that really there's nothing for your lower body to do. There's really no role of the lower body. In uh, Reactionary Golf Masterclass, we talk a lot, Tony, uh, we did in uh, Orlando when we made those videos about the role of the right. lower body and what to do with the lower body. So tell me a little bit about um, 
basically like how many percentage wise, this is something I asked Mike Bender when I was talking to him, percentage wise, how many golfers do you think really would even have like almost like a driver's license to do anything with their lower body? Like who's percentage wise of golfers, like who's even ready for lower body instructions? Uh, probably single digit handicapper. Okay. Um, so we're talking a small percent because most of the time the body is rotating faster than the arms swinging. Mm -hmm. So that's going to end up leaving a slice. So if you slice, you don't need to worry about lower body. Okay. If you hook the ball too much, mm -hmm. that could be an indicator that the lower body is being kind of stalled through impact. Right. And one of the things that makes people, uh, sorry, people misinterpret that they feel handsy at the bottom. That's just because they've overused their body in transition. We actually want to coordinate the arms and then drive through the body through impact. Okay. So, so to develop the arm swing, the, you think that's probably the top priority for, for most Correct. golfers of any level, you think? Or? Yeah. If we don't have these educated, especially how we go through and be able to control this, mm -hmm. So then we don't have control of the golf club, we don't have control of the ball, and we have high scores. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Tony, you were telling me the other day about uh, a new drill that you really like. Um, what, what, what is that drill? And I know you have a video coming out about it, but in, in a nutshell, what, what is it? Talking with one of our members, uh, Emery, who has some experience with uh, Dick Meyer, who won a U.S. Open back in the days, John Schley, which is a prodigy of Ben Hogan, talking to him about the arm swing and what Hogan really did and what those guys did and what he was told, even as far as Mac O'Grady, the whole idea of spinning to the hips doesn't work. So kind of Flamingo 2.0 is how the more of the post-up and how the arms have to swing through impact. Let's do the video of that together in Virginia. Okay. So, guys, stay tuned to Be a Better Golf, and we'll get deep into that on, on uh, when we're together. We have a Be Better Golf school coming up in Virginia in just a week. So, uh, sold out Be Better Golf school at Golden Horseshoe. We're crossing our fingers for no electricity and good weather, and, uh, good weather um, because it's looking spotty. But I think as long as we're okay with getting wet, I think it'll be fine. One thing that, that I wanted to, to encourage people to do, that if you guys are interested in the late part of June or early part of July in another Be Better Golf School, let us know where you are. And we, we could tag a last-minute one on because I um, don't really have anything planned till late July. And, but that's something that, uh, that I think that I know we would do to take advantage of Tony's time while, oh, he's, that, while, he, while he's off. So... Um, Tony, what, what else have you learned in, in the research that you've done this semester or recently? What, uh, what, else ha what else do you think is important for golfers to concentrate on when they're seeing or hearing a lot of golf pros like talk real scientifically? Like, what, do you, what have you seen in your research that, that you think that they should either be very wary of when they hear other golf pros talk about or what kind of you know, insight can you give us to how we should think of golf and science mixed together. Kind of what you started out with. We need to be careful from a motor control and motor learning standpoint. We're not trying to process information code by code by code. That's yeah. not going to make you a better golfer. You really kind of have to feel the shot. In external control, this is going to be a key component. You, I use my watch. You could use uh, other things, bands, whatever. But really creating the shot, seeing the shot, we're going to talk more about how we want to process this information in order to know before we hit the ball. Yeah, tell me a little bit about, because this is the first time I heard it, tell me a little bit more about the difference between feedback and feed forward. Forward. Okay. Okay, so if I, I get this cup here, and I'm going to go grab my drink, I'm actually dictating the pace of my hand. I'm evaluating where my hand is relative to the cup. And this system is giving me input. I'm processing it. And I'm having an output. 
Okay, then I correctly grab the cup. Yeah. That takes 180 milliseconds for that information to cycle through. Well, the downswing is only 250 milliseconds. So in the transition, we can control it. Once we get beyond that 180 milliseconds, it, we, can't, we can't fix it at the bottom. So that's the reason why this idea of what to do before it happens needs to be plugged in. And that's this internal motor program of getting those arms to go in order to stay up with the body instead of just if the body goes, now what I do? Feedback, oh, I'm out of position. I throw my hands at it. Right. And I think that in that feed forward kind of way, it could be a reason we've seen a lot of success swinging around, swinging around noodles and other uh, obstacles and things. Uh, because you're just trying to go get through that gate, that intention. Yeah. You know, as far as because you could try till you're blue in the face to feel it, and it might the feel might never actually show up in your swing if if exactly. you're not. So Tony, you can't see, but I'm putting on the screen now, and and uh, this is the out now reactionary golf masterclass, and it's here at bebettergolf.net/slash/premium. We're we're going to talk more about it in Virginia and we're going to do some live broadcast from Virginia. So stay tuned to that. Uh, final word, Tony, in our last minute here, create the longest swing possible with the driver, mm -hmm. fastest swing possible with the driver, get great at putting from three to 20 feet. And to me, if you get those two things going, you'll be able to control a wedge easier, control your irons better. So to, the driver swing takes care of the iron swing, I think, a little bit. A little bit. They are different. Yeah. But that's the key is learning how to create efficient speed. When we were talking to Richie, he, one of yeah. the things he was saying, when you're trying to break into a new level of, of golf, let's say from a multi-digit handicap to a single-digit handicap or from a – he said the thing that really separates the different levels of golfer really is uh, efficiency with driver. Right. Yeah. And um, that's one of the, the reasons that I got so involved with Tony stuff. And it's just you can hit driver with so much more confidence. The, other, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, something interesting, uh, Matty Dupre was saying, you know, he hits probably thousands of golf balls a day and his back never hurts him. And I was in I was in Florida playing golf with these two uh, Be Better golfers that were like 21 and 20. And at the end of a round of golf, I went and hit a bucket of balls, and they they hit it with me. And at the end of that bucket of balls, I went to get another bucket of balls, and they were both laying like on the ground and on the bench. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, my back is killing me. I cannot, I cannot sw swing anymore." Right. And these guys are, you know, in, in junior college. So, right. um, is there is there a difference in? And I think we've seen this a little bit in Tiger Woods' new swing. Is there a difference in driving? the motor control coming from the upper body rather than twerking with the lower body first and how it, how it protects your back. Oh, totally. When we see muscle activation in the pecs, obliques and lats, and we use the leg, how it's designed to be, which is a pose, we can swing off of it. Now, if we use the lumbar spine and try to rotate, it's not designed to work, rotate it that way. Is it yet to be proven, or is it not necessarily any faster to torque first and then and then to torque the lower body first and then kind of snap it through later? The, is that any faster? You could get a little bit more club head speed if you kind of flip it. Yeah. But the ball's all over the place. The, the thing is, you can maybe be able to make one, two, three, four, five swings torque the body, torque everything, and get a little bit more speed. But we're only talking a few miles an hour. But the damage to the body over a period of time isn't worth it. Down the range, I want my golfers to be able to hit 8 out of 10 shots that we're trying to achieve. Right. right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll remind you a final time about the Reactionary Golf Masterclass. If you guys are interested in the science behind the swing and everything like that, this is a great place to start. Also, Tony, if you uh, really want to get deep into it, Tony has his own deal over at ReactionaryGolf.com, which is called, Tony? Inside the Golf Lab. That's right. His own uh, membership area. 
So thanks for watching, everybody. Click the subscribe button.